So now the sermon series, kind of an odd one it might sound like for Lent, but I think it's a perfect one because we hear the thou shalt nots. I knew I grew up with all these thou shalt nots, but so much thou shalt let go leading us into letting go and letting God is perfect for Black History Month, the first two commandments today, because it opens with a self-identification as God, as a God of the Exodus, the liberator. As those who watched the Black Church on PBS this past week, you might recall that liberationist God of the Exodus story lies at the heart and soul of the African-American Christian experience. Indeed, liberator describes God's central character throughout scripture letting God's people go, and calls us to do the same. Let go, let God. Now, we don't have the time today to go rummage through the first commandments, do it scholarly justice, the different ordering of the ten by different faith traditions. Did you know that? Or how the Mosaic Covenant structure parallels international treaties of the day? Interesting stuff. How the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy means ten laws, how it painstakingly builds on these commandments. We don't have time for that today. We do address that in our Bible studies on Saturday. Yet this Lent, we will focus on the commandments before us, one and two today, as tools for our spiritual practice, even as we touch on their social, economic, and political implications. The spiritual practice of letting go and letting God. Yes, as the title you will see, letting go, letting God, yes, even in the midst of a pandemic. Now let us hear the good news. Commandments 1 and 2 today. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. Hear what the Spirit is saying to us, the church. Would you pray with me? Even in a pandemic, oh God, especially in a pandemic, you call us to let go. When there's not much we can feel that we have to give up, teach us to let go. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let me open today with a word from the gospel according to Jimmy Kimmel. Earlier this week, that comedian and talk show host stated in his monologue, and with all the terrible things going on right now, this year for Lent, I'm not giving up anything. I'm just giving up. The gospel according to Jimmy Kimmel. I think he's on to something. Don't give up any, anything. You know, just give up. That's just what I needed to hear. When Rosa pointed my attention to that the other day, I said, that's just what I needed to hear. For to me, to give up myself more than just giving up something for Lent means that I'm focusing a little more deeply, more mindfully on letting go and letting God. I thought Jimmy Kimmel put it beautifully. Don't give up anything, just give up. It's a humorous line, but it's a true one as well. Letting go, letting God by surrendering, giving up. Not something I am normally inclined to do to surrender, but these are not normal times. Times when where we may be given in our lives the gift of desperation to reach out. Much like the gift of desperation the ancient Israelites had when they gathered around Mount Sinai today, wandering for ages in the desert wilderness, reaching out, waiting to receive instruction from God via their anointed prophet, Moses. For like these ancient Israelites, 
wandering in their desert wilderness. We may not have anything more to give up in this pandemic except ourselves, except ourselves. And in our first commandment today, giving up ourselves means giving thanks to God for liberating us from our bondage in order to obey then the second commandment to discover that God and God alone provides. God liberates and God provides. So now let, us, let me show you each of these commandments before us on the slides before us. They speak specifically to each of us in these ways. You see the title at the top, our Lenten theme. Now look to the first commandment on your left. I found this image on the web and I found it to be a representative image. You see in the first bulletin point on the left, the first commandment, right? That's the way I had learned it. Now, what is it that we, particularly white Protestants, did not learn below that? That's not considered part of the first commandment. You see the scripture below that. What words are missing from the first commandment above it? It's the whole run-up, the whole meaning for the commandment. The words, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, to wrap up. Let's go and let God we must understand that that commandment, as you can see to the right, it counters enslavement, encounters liberation. It, counters, uh, it, it encounters liberation, it encounters our enslavement to the oppressor and to being oppressive. God commands us to risk becoming freed, not simply to be freed, to, but to be freed from the pharaohs in our midst. And as a friend of mine once said to me, Chuck, our spiritual life is more than about relief. It's about freedom. Chuck, how free do you want to be? So that's the question to ask ourselves today as a people, as a church. How free do we want to be? But also for each of us as individuals. Now, rightfully so, we've seen pronouns in this more gender fluid age of people identifying themselves as he or she, or they, but you know when it comes down to it, the, the most used pronouns in English language are me, myself, and I. And there is a personal enslavement that is either all up to me, as you see on the slide, neurosis, or it's all about me. Our accomplishments, our achievements, career, causes, we are often a human doing versus a human being. So that enslavement can apply to us as groups of people, as a nation, being oppressor or being oppressed. Where is the freedom on all sides of that? Where is the freedom? And how free does each of us want to be? Our Lenten call today, I find, is gratitude to God's grace for releasing us from that bondage. I am the Lord your God who brought you out. This calls for gratitude. I once went to a stewardship conference and I asked the stewardship person, what is the he, first one thing that we can do to improve stewardship? That is buy-in. That's what that means really in the church. And he said, write 10 gratitudes a week. Now we have about a 40 or 50 member body. I'm not writing 10 gratitudes a week, but not just to the church, but to other people literally writing them, not emailing, not texting, writing. That's way, one way of showing gratitude. That's one way of letting go and letting God. Thou shalt, shalt let go, command at the bottom, let go in our lives of what binds us and others. Be grateful as a people and as persons in gratitude for liberation. Next slide. You see here, the second commandment. I like the King James Version, so I'll put it on the left. The way I had originally learned it, graven image. There's that objectification of God. And, and this commandment counters a sense of not enoughness. We need more gods around us. We need something that can drive us, because there's just not enough. I'm not enough. I can't do enough. I should be enough. Or there's just not enough in this world to go around. 
which is why we have the acquisitive, consuming, producing society we do, because there just isn't enough. But God counters that in the second commandment. First of all, the graven image part, objectification of God. The divine subject becomes divine object. We can do that with Jesus as well. You, sometimes I think Jesus becomes for us an object of faith rather than a way of faith. Jesus becomes something we can worship and adore, which feels glorious, versus following him, which can seem very human and not very glorious at all. And sometimes you can kind of close your eyes and get a picture of Jesus as objectified through the head of Christ. You know that Warner Salmon painting that many of us see of the brown-haired, blue-eyed Jesus stamped on the back of our eyeball. We love to objectify Jesus, whether it be an actual graven image or something that we hold him out to be to look at rather than to look with. Or any likeness of anything, the second part of this commandment, idols are talking about, objectification of God's creation. We see it a lot in our world, frankly, with how women are treated. But also you see below this, economics, political, in more in broader ways, we, we lift up as gods our production, our consumption, all good things, but what is best Idols are not bad, it's just what they obscure that is better. Production or distribution. How can we distribute what we produce? Consumption or stewardship. How can we steward what we consume? Production and consumption can become idols. Just as savior figures in our political world, we, we've seen the mess caused in the last four years by a savior figure to so many. And that can be the case for the next four years as well. It happened under Obama. We thought we were in a post-racial society, pinning all our hopes, our expectations on someone else or some group of someone else's. You get the picture. Im graven images, likeness of anything, and that wonderful quote in purple in the middle here. Patrick Miller, in his book, The Ten Commandments, writes, the Babylonian people make gods and carry them. The Lord makes a people and carries them. And so out of the gratitude for being liberated, the Exodus story continues into generosity. Our call is, there is enough. God alone provides. The God of the Exodus experience. Read the whole book one time. Just read it up into chapter 20. You see the God, the liberator. You see God as being generous and sharing with us manna in the wilderness. The people were never at a lack, though they always felt they were about to be at a lack. Thou shalt let go command for us this year. Let go of our fear of scarcity. Read the scripture. Be liberated. There is enough that we might reach out and greet God and others because there is enough. And that's what communion is about today. We have enough. So as we drop the slide, I want to come back and speak with you directly. To wrap up this whole installment of the first two commandments, letting go and letting God. Commandment one, no other gods before God's face. By the way, that's the literal interpretation in Hebrew. You shall have no gods before my face. Because God alone, as we can make out the contours of God's face, we can never see the face clearly. As one writer puts it, those who asked to see the face of God didn't make that mistake to ask the same thing twice. But as we can make out the contours of God's face, God alone liberates us from oppression and from being the oppressor. There's a new book out by Heather McGee, I believe her name is, called The Sum of Us, about how the oppressor and the oppressed are being released together if we see and confront the racism in front of us. 
And so our Lenten call in this liberation is to be grateful, to let go in our lives what binds us and others. And finally, commandment number two, no graven images of God and no idols. So how do we react to the generosity? We're set free. Where we go? We're in the wilderness. Is there enough? If the first commandment calls us to be grateful for our liberation, the second one calls us to be generous because there is enough. No idols need apply. Just as we let go of what binds us in commandment number one, we can then in our newfound freedom, let go of our fear of scarcity. Because it's our fear of scarcity as more entitled Christians that prevent others from having enough. They don't know that they can have enough, but we have to believe it first, that there is enough. To trust in the God who provides far more than what Pharaoh or even Wall Street can ever provide. To let go of our cling to there's not enough, let's get more in our world. So commandment one, God the liberator to commandment two, God the provider, letting go of our bondage. And in our wilderness freedom, it's wild out there, letting go of our fear that there's just not enough, which we can do as a church when we have each other's back, that there's just not enough. Let, giving up nothing for let, let's just give up and surrender to our one God by giving up all our gods before us in order to let go. All to discover there is enough for us to share. Give up to let go. And in that radical free, freedom, in that radical freedom to discover, yes, I have enough. Thanks be to God.